I think we are ready. Okay, so are we live now? Yes. All right. Hey, everybody. This is Richard Sachs. I'm a host from Lost Arts Radio. And this is a special treat for me today that the show with a, a friend that I've been following. I uh, never got to meet him in person yet. He's in Mexico, but I thought his work is really great. And he's been explaining an aspect of anarchy that is diametrically opposed to what we hear about all the time on mainstream media, um, that it's actually not violent, crazy people running around burning down buildings. It's people who don't need to be uh, dominated by uh, tyranny in every aspect of their lives. And they have mutual respect and cooperation out of a spirit of volunteering that cooperation. It's a completely different concept. And I... I think it's really important and wanted to get a chance to go into it. So I asked Jeff if he would come on the show with us and uh, and talk about that. And we're going to go back into what led him to this point. But I think out of um, in honor of how he always starts his shows, I want to ask um, the last stage of how you became an anarchist, Jeff. <laughs> yeah, always turning the tables on me. That's uh, a good yeah. to do. I, I've asked that question about 400 times. Uh, <laughs> oh, I bet. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I think we're all born anarchists. I think that's pretty obvious uh, for people out there who don't understand the word. And of course, you can always get angry at labels or misunderstand labels. I think it's very important that we understand what we're talking about here. And I think most people today don't even really understand the words they're talking about when they're arguing with each other. So it's it's yeah. completely pointless to even have any sort of debate or argument or even a conversation if you are both talking about two separate things. So let's just define what I call the word anarchy. It's an old Greek word. It means an, uh, without, archi, ruler. Uh, that doesn't mean no rules. It means no rulers. And when you say no rulers, that means you don't want any slaves. So essentially you're against slavery. And this is something that a lot of people don't understand. So if you aren't an anarchist, if and if you're not an anarchist in general, what you are is called a statist. That, believe, that is a belief that there should be something that owns you, a, a, a ruler, whether it be a king, a queen, or a prime murderer, or a president, or whatever you want to call them, all the different names they have for all these different rulers. Uh, if you believe in that, then you believe in slavery, and you believe people should be enslaved. So... Uh, most people today actually believe in slavery, and uh, they believe in complete and total slavery over everyone instead of uh, what it used to be, which was, you know, not that many people, mostly Africans uh, in in the south of, of the U.S., and actually in a number of different countries, but it wasn't really worldwide. After they ended that, the people who kind of owned a lot of this stuff said, oh, let's uh, actually enslave everyone, and that's what they've done. And by slavery, I mean when you're born, uh, someone claims to own you. Uh, and that would be today governments and uh, governments don't actually even exist. This is the crazy part about the whole thing. So basically everyone's just brainwashed. The word government uh, actually, if you just look at the words govern, uh, that is uh, Latin uh, gubernar for uh, control and ment, mente here in Mexico, mente is mind in, in Latin as well, I believe. So it's basically mind control and that's what it is. There is no actual government. Uh, there are just people. Government is just a concept, an idea that enough people have been brainwashed or programmed into to actually think is legitimate and because of that they allow people with costumes walking around to go around and extort and kill people if they don't do what they don't want them to do and that's what we have today so as I pointed out I believe that all people are born uh, believing that we should not be slaves I don't know any babies that I've ever talked to that once they start talking start talking that we all need to be enslaved and there needs to be someone who controls us all uh, it's quite quickly though after they go into the government indoctrination camps which they call public schools or government schools and start doing their pledge of allegiance and go home and watch their television programming and it's called programming programming for a reason it is literally brainwashing uh, many people start to believe in the superstition called government and start to believe that we all need to be enslaved. And they don't even really realize that that's what it is. They think it's a great thing because that's what it's been told to them in the schools and on the propaganda in the programming and Hollywood movies and all this sort of stuff saying it's so great to be slaves. And, and that's essentially the case. So, Doug, are you still there? Yeah. Hold on, everybody. This appears to be a connection problem on the Mexico internet. Yeah. So. Yeah, maybe we need to um, We want to call, well, he did the hanging up yeah, part. Yeah, let's just uh, let's add him back in now and see if we can make yeah, it work. Yeah. Sorry, everybody. So, Skype for you and 
he's in Mexico, so who knows? Right. There's interesting things going on too in the internet. Right as you cross the border into Mexico, they've they've got something that cuts off cell service right as you drive across. I don't know how they do that. Oh, really? Yeah, that's interesting. Like an actual fence, you know. Mm-hmm. Hello. You're back. Hey, it looks like my Skype crashed as usual. Ever since your Microsoft Skype crashed, crashed it's, it's been garbage. Yeah, well, you were just at the part we heard you say that everybody believes they should be enslaved, apparently, completely. <laughs> yeah, I, I forget. I don't, actually don't know when it dropped off, so I actually was continuing talking there until I, I finished talking, and you didn't oh, respond, okay. and I realized. So I don't remember exactly where it dropped off, so... Yeah, um, you have to be a human DVR and go back about <laughs> one minute. And I think you were just saying that uh, you said that government doesn't really exist. It's a set of ideas, and and you talked about programs on television, which are called programs for a reason, and they're programming. And they convince everybody that this system is real and unavoidable and necessary for your protection. And that's about where we got to. Yeah, I think all I said after that was that, uh, for me personally, um, I... Uh, didn't really know what the philosophy of anarchy was or any of these sort of uh, ideas were until well into my 20s, nearly 30 years old, when I I met Doug Casey, uh, who's an anarcho-capitalist, voluntarist, anarchist, uh, well-known one, and he became a bit of a mentor of mine. And very Socratic uh, method-like of him at dinner one night, he asked me a number of questions, and uh, I answered them, and there were generally questions like, what do you think about this? Do you think uh, the, the businesses should be regulated in this way? All these sort of questions. And at the end of it, he said, you know what you are, don't you? And I said, no, what am I? And, and he said, you're an anarchist. And I was like many people out there still today who I said, well, you mean those people with black masks who break Starbucks windows and throw Molotov cocktails? And he's like, no, that's what they want us to think it is, but that's not what it is. And uh, pretty much from that moment on, I looked into it. And as soon as I realized that this was a philosophy, that this was an understanding of the way the world is uh, and works, and and very quickly, I just became enthralled with it. And I read everything I could on the philosophy, on anything related to it, including things like Austrian economics, anything free market related, anything freedom related. Uh, libertarianism, everything, Murray Rothbard, Mises, everything. And by the end of it, I said, this is this is information most people are unaware of, and this is incredibly important information. So that's when I first started doing things like the Dollar Vigilante and my show Anarchast, which has turned into the conference in Erica Poco now, uh, was just to get this information out there, because your average person just has no idea about any of this. Right, and you mentioned Dollar Vigilante. For the people that don't know about that, why don't you say what that is, how it came about, and what it's doing now? Sure. Um, I had an internet company during the tech bubble in the 90s, and it was actually worth, at at the peak, about $240 million. And then after the tech bubble burst, it was worth almost nothing. Uh, My business partner jumped out of an eight-story window, actually survived. And once he got out of the hospital, he brought a book to me. It was was the book The Creature from Jekyll Island by G. Edward Griffin. And I read, it's a very thick book, (laughs) and I was like, why are you giving me this book? And he's like, just read it. And I read it, and it essentially explains how central banking works and how they cause all these booms and busts. And it made everything perfectly clear about how everything works in the economy with the monetary system, with the financial system, Uh, things that most people just have no idea about is it's literally almost hidden information from mo- most people they don't teach you in schools they don't teach you in college they don't teach you how the monetary system works on purpose because if everyone understood how it works uh, henry ford said actually in the early 20th century if everyone understood how the monetary system works there'd be a revolution tomorrow so i read that book and I just uh, began again going into more and more Austrian economics stuff, uh, Mises, uh, uh, all kinds of people, um, and and really realized this is really important information. And so after a a while of traveling the world and actually seeing the world with my own eyes and realizing almost everything on television is propaganda and programming and not even close to real, uh, that I uh, I decided I needed to do something to get this information out there. And one of the I'm, I have a background in uh, investing and in finance and in, in uh, 
uh, stocks and things like that. So I decided to start a financial newsletter called the Dollar Vigilante, which I called right at the very beginning. It's an anarcho-capitalist a financial newsletter based in Austrian economics, which is basically uh, free market economics, and uh, just basically tried to get this information out there about how these things actually work, because the people who actually control these things really don't want anyone to understand how it all works, and and the reasons are because if people really did, they're, they're, most people would be incredibly upset. They'd probably go after and try to kill most of these people, because they'd realize they've been robbing the entire world for centuries. They've been impoverishing people. They've been uh, destroying um, killing hundreds of millions of people through these systems, uh, you can't have these major worlds. There's World War One, World War Two, which no one even knew what was even about. It's all bankers' wars caused by central bankers, and they, they actually fund both sides, and they do it just for fun. Actually, they're they're really sick, uh, <laughs> depraved people who enjoy seeing other people getting really hurt, and they love uh, seeing them impoverished, and they do it all through the central banking system. So that's really why I started the Dollar Vigilante was to start to bring this information out to people who were unaware of how this whole system works. Well, you know, and that brings up. A lot of you know points, any of which could be a ten-hour show. But but one thing that comes to mind is that people's um, image of the banks is this place that's keeping everybody's money safe and it's full of gold and everything. And you know the reason that they're able to even fund what they want to is because they've got all this solid value money, and it's not exactly like that, right? <laughs> no, not even close. <laughs> uh, the money itself used to, in the U.S., for example, uh, used to actually be backed, the dollar used to be backed by gold and silver uh, in various ways. And th that all got taken away over 100 years ago, well, actually less than 100 years ago, but uh, over 100 years ago, in 1913, was when the third central bank of the U.S. was founded, the Federal Reserve, as we know it today. And it was founded on Christmas Eve in 1913, and the president at the time, who I believe was Woodrow Wilson, said afterwards in his memoirs that he felt sick that he allowed it to happen. He, he essentially allowed the country to be sold to the bankers, and that's what, exactly what happened. It was essentially a banker takeover of the U.S., which still goes on today. It's actually the, the way they control every country now. And uh, back then, as I pointed out, the dollar was actually backed by precious metals. So that's why part of the reason why there was two reasons, main reasons why the U.S. was really an economic powerhouse and really became so wealthy. Even in the last hundred years, it's still residue from what happened before. And that was that the money was sound. It was actually backed by gold and silver. That's very important. If you're going to have a good economy that grows and people are going to have the ability to increase their capital, the money has to be a sound money. And they also had quite a bit of freedom and private property rights in the U.S. This has almost all gone away now. Uh, but back then, they, they really did. There was no income tax actually until 1913, the exact same year when they put in the, the central bank, the Federal Reserve. And that's not a coincidence whatsoever. This is all a plan by them to impoverish and enslave all people, including all people in the U.S. Um, many people don't realize that uh, uh, most people in the U.S. today, actually almost all people in the U.S., are the most financially enslaved people in human history. Uh, most people have no idea about this. This, this is how uh, crazy it is and how well they've hidden it all, but they are just truly enslaved. So uh, you have, uh, they come in in 1913, put in the Federal Reserve, and very quickly they, they went and they expanded the money supply dramatically on purpose in the 1920s to create the boom in the 1920s. They knew exactly what they were doing. Those people like J.P. Morgan, uh, the Rothschilds, all these sort of people, even uh, Rockefeller and many others uh, were involved at the time. And they knew if they uh, rescinded the money supply, that it would cause a massive market crash. And that's exactly what happened in 1929, which is now known as the Great Depression. This was all on purpose. This all documented. You can actually go back and look at documents where they were planning to do this. Uh, a lot of people just look at it as, oh, that was weird that that happened. No, it was actually all on purpose. It's all, always done by the central banks this way. So they pump up the money supply. The markets rise because people don't realize that all this new money has come out. They figure everyone's all of a sudden rich for some reason, but it's actually not true. They're actually poor. The money's actually worth less, but there's more of it. This is what yeah, when you, when, is. Jeff, when you say pump up the money supply, let I understand what you mean, but let's clarify for people. It's not the bankers taking, you know, a few truckloads of gold and, and putting them out to the public so everybody can use them. It's <laughs> it's it's a little different than that, and it's tied to what's called inflation, right? Yeah, that is what inflation is. So to to 
briefly go through the rest and I'll get to why they don't have okay. any gold backing it. So after okay. 19, uh, after the Great Depression, they used this as a reason to uh, actually confiscate gold in the land of the free. In 1933, uh, they put out a executive order uh, that no Americans could legally own gold anymore. Now, of course, a lot of smart Americans uh, just kept their gold anyway and didn't listen to the government laws, which I always approve of. Uh, never listen to any of their laws. I don't care what their laws are. Uh, and um, uh, this went on until the 1970s when actually the U.S. went bankrupt again and went bankrupt for a number of reasons. One of them was the Vietnam War, which is a massive terror attack on Vietnam and Cambodia and all the countries in that area uh, by the U.S. again. And they spent so much money that they went bankrupt. And back then, the, the U.S. dollar still, you could trade it in for gold. Uh, your regular person couldn't. They'd already made it illegal for your uh, Americans to own gold. But if you, uh, for example, if the, the French government uh, who... Uh, owned a bunch of U.S. Treasury bonds, if they wanted, they could actually turn in the Treasury bonds and the dollars themselves and actually get gold. That was rescinded on August 15, 1971 by Richard, I'm not a crook, Nixon. Uh, and he said that because of money speculators, we're going to delink the dollar from gold. So that was the last time the U.S. dollar had any sort of link to precious metals, to any sort of link to gold. And because of what happened during that time, because everyone else had pegged their currency, every other country in the world had pegged theirs to the U.S. dollar because it was backed by gold when the US dollar stopped being backed by gold every other currency the Canadian dollar Australian dollar Chinese one uh, Japanese uh, every, every single currency um, uh, all became a fiat currency. All of a sudden, none of them were backed by gold because they were actually linking it to a gold-backed U.S. dollar. All of a sudden, every currency in the world was completely just a piece of paper with dead criminals printed on it. And that's all it was. And there was nothing backing it. And that's, it's been that way since 1971. So uh, if you ask your average person, you say, well, what's actually you know backing the dollar? A lot of people still think believe it's gold. Uh, they, they don't know that's all been taken away in the last 100 years, and especially in 1971. And then when you even ask them, well, what do you think's actually in your bank account? A lot of people imagine there's this vaults full of U.S. dollar bills, hundred dollar bills everywhere. No, there's absolutely nothing. In fact, they make it all up. It's all computer money. They just print it at, uh, they just create it at a, at a press of a button. So there's something called fractional reserve banking, and they the banks can actually print essentially as much money. They've taken away every sort of rule about how much you can print now. They can just print up as much money as they want. Uh, they can print up a trillion dollars tomorrow if they want. And and then that's essentially what they've been doing. That's what happened in 2008. Uh, they can just print up as much money as they want. Now, of course, the end game of all this is once you print up enough money, the money becomes worthless. That's called hyperinflation. That's stuff that we've seen in Zimbabwe about 10 years ago, uh, Venezuela in the last few years, uh, many different countries. And this happens all the time. Whenever you print too much money, it becomes worthless. That's just supply and demand. So to answer your question in the, in the short uh, form after a very long answer, no, there's absolutely nothing backing your money whatsoever. It's actually in a bank account that's just a, a number on a computer. That's why it's kind of funny when people say they don't like Bitcoin because it's just computer money. That's what the U.S. dollar is. Almost all U.S. dollars is just computer money. And not only that, but the banks don't have the actual money to back what they say is in your account. And all these banks are massively leveraged to the point where if the market even if bonds even fall five or six percent, uh, all banks in the U.S. will be bankrupt, and they will actually just say that they don't owe you your money anymore. And actually, the FDIC, which they say is the government insures all of the money in the bank account, that's bankrupt as well. That's been they've said they're bankrupt for a long time. They have no money in the FDIC, uh, and so when this all goes down, you're going to essentially lose everything. Uh, all the all the U.S. dollars, all currencies in the world, all fiat currencies will go to zero, and it's going to happen fairly. Soon. We're not talking about decades, we're talking about the next few years. What makes them uh, able to go bankrupt if they have the ability to just print whatever they need? What does that mean to go bankrupt in that situation? Well, that, that, that's a good point because what happened in 2008 is uh, you, they printed the, a lot of money, it created this bubble, and then they, they stopped printing so much money and created the crash. And what happened is things like Lehman Brothers and all these other big banks were so leveraged that even when the market started to go down a bit, they were so leveraged that they were essentially bankrupt. So there's two things that can happen when a bank goes bankrupt. It can just go bankrupt and all depositors lose their money, um, or it can be bailed out by either the Federal Reserve itself or by the government, and that's what happened in 2008. So you're correct in that 
Yes, you could have all these banks go bankrupt, technically, but they could be bailed out by the U.S. government uh, and the Federal Reserve printing up enough money to actually make them liquid again. But by doing that, when the next one happens, when all the banks go uh, under, which will happen, this is just uh, baked in the cake, this is just math, this, there's no disputing it, it's impossible for it not to at this point, uh, they will... Um, they could, if they want, and they probably will, print up enough money to make all the banks solvent again, but that will actually make the U.S. dollar almost worthless because they'll have printed up tens of trillions of dollars. Uh, they'll expand the money supply at such a rate, it will essentially turn into what we have in Venezuela today with the money just becoming worthless almost overnight. Right, right. Um, you made a comment in the beginning of what you were saying that the anarchists believe that there are, are, there's no ruler, but there's rules. So, if that's the case, the obvious question is, well, if the ruler's not there, who makes the rules? Yeah, good question. Uh, th there doesn't have to be rules, but there almost always is rules. What you find in a free society or any place where there is no overarching government is people kind of come up with their own rules, whether it be a little town or it could be your uh, condos. Uh, if you have a condo, everyone seems to have a condo committee, and that makes its own rules for its condo area. Uh, you go into a town, they often have their own rules in that area, uh, whatever those rules might be. So it's generally that people come up with their own rules rules on their own just to to in their own area with their own societies for whatever reasons. Uh, the only thing that I don't like is when those rules are forced upon people who didn't agree to them. So this all comes down to voluntary agreement of things. So uh, if uh, you came in, I, I'm here in Acapulco, Mexico right now. If you showed up with a bunch of guns and a bunch of guys, you said new rules, you can't have computers anymore. <laughs> I'd be like, get out of here. <laughs> and and you might go, well, we're going to kill you, put you into a cage. That's what governments do and, and stuff like that. And maybe you will and maybe I'll fight back or whatever. But uh, uh, basically, we we should have rules that people agree to. So if I'm in an area here and everyone in the neighborhood says, hey, let's get together later. You know, there's been a problem with uh, people, uh, ro uh, robbery problem. Why don't we make a rule that uh, we can't have go out on the street after midnight uh, without a certain permit or pass or whatever, if that's whatever rule that they want. If everyone in the whole community agrees to it, great, no problem. But if some people don't want to do it, they shouldn't be forced to do it. So it's really about just saying that rules uh, can't be forced upon people. They have to be agreed upon. And that's something that everyone sort of understands from a very young age is, of course, you have to agree. You can't just force someone to do something. You tell two little kids who are three years old, uh, you know, you can't just steal Tommy's toys, uh, Bobby. <laughs> you just can't do this. It's not, you know, they're not allowed, really. It's not a good thing to be doing. Uh, the kids really understand that. But if, for some reason, as the people get into adulthood and they go through the government indoctrination camps and all the propaganda, all of a sudden they go, oh, well, no, it's good that uh, people make these rules that we have no say in whatsoever, and and they take our money, extortion, uh, which they call taxation, and they can just spend it on whatever they want. They say we have a say in it, but that's like checking a box every four years, which is actually just a total sham uh, that has no, you have no say in anything. You're, you're basically, everyone who lives in a area with a big government, like almost every country in the world today, it's it's nothing legitimate. It's it's literally the largest criminal organization in that area has uh, managed to become so big and so predominant that they have taken control of even the schools and the and the television programming to the point where they've actually convinced and brainwashed many of the people that they aren't under the control of a criminal organization anymore. Then that they should actually be proud of it. So they go out on July fourth and be all proud and wave the flag of the people who own them. Uh, it's it's quite shocking to see the, how well it works, but. Uh, that's truly the case. There's there's literally no difference. And just think about this. What is the difference between mafia and government? The only difference really is size. The government's bigger than the mafia. Right, right. Um, so, so there are a couple of points from what you said. One is that um, if you don't want 51% of the people deciding what should happen to everybody else against their will, you don't want what's called democracy under any circumstances, right? That's a terrible system. Not only is democracy a terrible system for the reason you just outlined, that it's literally mob rule, uh, that if 51% of people decide they want to kill the other 49, they can just vote it and it kind of yeah. will happen. Uh, yeah. That's that's just horrible. Uh, but not only is it, it's, it's worse than that because democracy functions in such a way that because your average person doesn't pay much attention to it. Uh, so 
what the people who are smart have figured out is we'll just pay off all the politicians and we'll just control everything. There was actually a really good thing that just came out. I forget what it was. It was an organization that did a study and it showed uh, it's kind of a little complicated without a chart to show, but it essentially said, you know, from a scale of zero to 100 of things that people really want or things that people really don't want. Um, really, it does not matter at all. <laughs> it, it, there's about 30% of things just go through in a democracy. And actually, the things that the very elites want, the, the very rich people want, they always go through. Because, the, the, for example, the rich people are always quite smart. You have to agree with that, right? Like, in general, unless they were born into a family and, and, their, and their parents had it, in general, your average rich person has figured out a way to get a lot of money through hopefully producing some really good quality things. Like Steve Jobs produced Apple and, and produced iPhone phones for everyone. Hopefully they did something like that. They're generally very smart people. Well, these very smart people also have figured out, well, if there's going to be government, if people are going to want to be enslaved, we can kind of make that government do whatever we want using money, which is actually currency. And it's called currency for a reason. It's a way of exchanging energy. And using currency, they can make the government do whatever it wants. So your average person out there who, who believes they, they want democracy, so they believe they want to be in a system where it's mob rule, uh, not only do they, are they, do I think they're totally, you know, <laughs> screwed up for wanting that, but what they believe is actually working for them and they're actually casting a vote and, and their vote's going to matter <laughs> and it's going to make things better for them is, is just totally uh, delusional. It, it's never worked like that in any democracy in the world. You just look at the U.S. today. Just look at <laughs> all the laws. There's literally millions of laws now that I don't think anyone wants uh, and you know you can't sell food to the homeless people or give food to the homeless people you can't even give it to the homeless people in many places uh, most people don't want to be extorted but th that happens so it's it's a facade it's what they brought in after kings and queens because people started to figure out this whole king queen thing is kind of stupid it's like who are these people who think they have a certain bloodline and so therefore they can rule us and own us and we are their slaves so people woke up to that a few hundred years ago in most places not so much in places like england and and uh, other places like that but in most places people woke up and then the people who kind of were controlling things said well let's let's give them make them think they own the government and that's what the whole idea of democracy was a democracy is just a a a scam on humanity from my opinion Right. So uh, what you were talking about with these little groups of people, if they could agree on things, that would be essentially little impromptu governments run by the people in that group. What happens if they can't agree on stuff? Then things just work out. Uh, you know, you, <laughs> that's the thing that, that people don't really fully understand or get or like about free markets. It, the big question that people always have is, well, what will happen if someone does this? It's like, I don't know. I, I'm not there. Uh, whoever's yeah. there at that moment in time gets to decide what's going to happen. So, for example, let's say someone just raped my next door neighbor. Uh, or let's say it's a little uh, girl. Let's say she's like six years old. Let's make sure everyone really hates this act, right? And uh, someone had just raped the six-year-old girl next door. Maybe it was her father. Her father just raped the six-year-old girl next door and everyone in our neighborhood knows about it. Well, without a government, what are we going to do? I don't know. I don't really like that a lot. Uh, I, I especially don't like that. I'm probably going to go talk to that father at the very least mm -hmm. and make sure that he never does that again. There might be some other people who get really angry and go, I'm going to kill that guy. Okay. Well, okay. So Bob from down the street just killed the guy who just, we just found out was raping a six year old little girl. What am I going to do with Bob? Well, he just killed that rapist guy. I don't have a problem with Bob, really, <laughs> but it's fine. Um, I, I wouldn't have killed the guy myself. I think that's too extreme, but hey, that's what Bob wanted to do, and I don't have a problem with it. I, I'm worried about this little girl now. How are we going to take care of this little girl? we got to figure that out, but I'm not going to get all angry at Bob. I'm not going to go and kill Bob because he killed the rapist guy. I'll be like, you know, this is how like society works itself out. This has actually worked fine for entire human history, but now they, they want it like, oh, well, now you have to call the government. So so what happens now? So now I call 911. Guy comes, 
Cops come, there's a whole big thing. It's going to be years in court, all kinds of problems. And not only that, but I can do that even if the guy didn't rape that little girl, right? So if I don't like my neighbor, I can go, yeah, he just raped his little girl. It's going to be all this chaos and horrible stuff going on for like years and, and thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of dollars in, in lawyers and all this sort of stuff. When we could have just fig figured it all out on our own very quickly that same day that we found out he was raping his, his daughter, right? Um, so really, it comes down to personal uh, individual uh, deciding what to do in their own situation and working things out with their neighbors. And this is kind of what's so sick or wrong with statism. If you talk to most people today, they don't even know who their neighbors are. There's no sense of community, no nothing. If there's ever a problem, people are calling the government and, and the government comes and, and they just cause problems. The cops come and they shoot people's dogs and they're arresting the wrong people and they're arresting them for, oh, they had a plant in their pocket. It's like, it's complete chaos. The thing that people say is anarchy is what government is. Yeah. Uh, people think anarchy is chaos. Government is complete chaos. Anarchy is usually, for the most part, everyone just getting along because that's how societies normally organize themselves, is just figuring out ways to get along with other people. So what would happen in each small group would depend on the consciousness of the people in that group, basically, right? Yeah, absolutely. It, it just depends on them, what they want to do. Um, and, you know, there's so many examples of it. There's a book that I, I really recommend for people because a lot of people really ask, what would the world be like without government? And there's a really good book and it's like this big, it's like a, it's a brochure almost. You can read it about two hours and it's called The Market for Liberty. And it's by, uh, I, I believe the last name is Tana, Tana Hill. And um, it was a, it was a, 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 a a uh, man and a woman, a, a couple that wrote the book uh, about 30, 40 years ago. It's actually for free on the internet if you don't want to spend the five bucks for a Kindle version or Amazon version or wherever you want to get it version from whatever bookstore you normally buy from. Uh, you can get it uh, for free as a PDF. Uh, just uh, look for the Market for Liberty PDF. And uh, it explains how most things would probably work. And once you read that book, you start to realize everything would work so much better without the government. It really would. You just have to just really briefly look through that book and, and you realize everything would just work better without it. What about the, uh, the question, and, and these are not objections, this is just a dimensional clarification of everything. Mm -hmm. um, what about the fact that government has a uh, nefarious ally right now, very powerful one, which is a cartel of highly organized and cooperative global corporations that are not friendly. And if government goes away and there are no regulations at all, what is to prevent private gangs like those from taking over instead of government? Okay, this is a very easy one to answer because those corporations wouldn't exist without government. Corporations themselves are a made-up thing by government. Right. Uh, in a free market, you wouldn't have a corporation because... What a corporation is essentially is the government saying, okay, this is a corporation and whatever this is has rights, which we bestow onto it. And a lot of those rights are not having to actually uh, pay for a lot of damage they do, especially the individuals involved in the corporation. So a lot of people start a corporation so that even if the corporation really screws up and kills a bunch of people by accident and it uh, poisons a river or something, they don't yeah. actually get really in trouble. It's, oh, it's the corporation. The corporation is thought of as like a human. It's given rights like a human from the government. So okay. that alone, when without government, there would be no corporations. All of a sudden, businesses would have to structure themselves differently. Now, what you're talking about is a major problem. This is called crony capitalism or fascism, it essentially is the business interests working with the government in order to get what they want through the government. Right. And the, the thing you're asking is, could things like Monsanto go into a country and, and make it so all farmers have to use their seeds? Well, they're doing that right now, and they're doing that because there's governments. And the governments say, okay, we've been bought out by Monsanto, and now all farmers have to use their seeds, or we're going to come in with our government forces and start killing them all. Now, if there wasn't, or putting them in jail or whatever it is, and yeah. if there wasn't a government there, then Monsanto would actually have to go and do that themselves. And McDonald's would have to do that themselves. And if Starbucks wanted to really get cheap labor for coffee uh, in Colombia, they would actually have to go there and do the things that the government's doing. So Starbucks would all of a sudden have to have a little mil militia unit. It'd go in and say to the farmers, okay, you have to uh, provide us this much coffee at this price, uh, no matter what. 
that would go on YouTube pretty quick. There'd be a huge uproar, and uh, hopefully people would stop uh, drinking their coffee from Starbucks until this sort of activity stopped. And this is actually true democracy. This is what democracy is supposed to be. Democracy is actually you voting with your dollar. And by doing that, we, people would see if these corporations or these businesses that they were uh, using, for example, I personally like Starbucks, I have to admit it. I do like their Frappuccinos. I, I've gotten addicted to them. They've, they've done a really good job of getting me addicted to their, their Frappuccinos. It's my only sugar item that I really just must have almost every day. And I, I do admit that. And But if, um, if I knew they were doing really, really bad things, I would stop drinking my Starbucks uh, coffee. I'd be like, that's terrible. I, I can't believe they're doing that. But they hide that all behind the government stuff that they do. So uh, like I said, Monsanto is actually forcing a lot of farmers around the world, across the world to actually use their seeds, but they're not doing it themselves. They're doing it through government. So people don't actually see it. So a lot of people will say, well, it's the corporations. We should get rid of the corporations and everything would be fine. It's in fact, we have to get rid of the government and everything would be fine. Without governments, there would be no ability for these corporations corporations to do the things that they're doing. There's always going to be human greed. There's always, well, maybe not always, but for the foreseeable future, I see no near term, next few decades sort of a thing where we're not going to have anyone who has any greed. But basically you're saying without government, the private gangs would not be able to do what they're doing to people. Absolutely. Uh, this is uh, the problem. So a lot of people uh, like to think that the problem is the government, but it's actually the problem. Is, or sorry, the, the problem is the corporations, the business interests. But the problem is actually the government. If people stop believing that government have these special rights, which they don't have, it's an actual uh, belief in something that's not real, then they couldn't do these things. And the corporations couldn't make the governments do these things. But the, because the government exists and because, because people will actually listen to government and they will bow down to whatever laws they make, that's what the corporations, the big business interests use is is the government's power against people. So the way if you want to fix these sort of things, the way to fix them is to try to get rid of government in one way or another, try to make people realize that they are illegitimate and to stop following their orders. In that way, the, the business interests and the corporations could not do most of these bad things that a lot of people think they're doing that are bad. Some of them I might disagree with or agree with. For example, like mining, some people might say, oh, they should stop all mining, it's hurting the earth. It's like, well, if we don't have mining, we don't have cars, computers, planes, <laughs> uh, pretty much houses, anything really. Uh, but some people might think that's really bad, right? This is why it's always bad to have a, a sort of a government because a lot of really bad ideas can be amplified using government. So those people who say mining should be all stopped, you know, maybe the, you know, maybe they're right, maybe they're wrong. Maybe the, you know, maybe this is destroying the world mining. I don't know, but we will pretty quickly not have any any sort of material sort of things whatsoever, uh, and that's going to cause a lot of problems. So, you know, the big issue is is just allowing people to have this ability to have these sort of big. Um, uh, effects on things um, and uh, so you know, it gets very confusing for a lot of people but but really when it comes down to if you, if you don't like corporations you don't like what these big uh, what they call uh, international or transnational or or whatever you want to call these these jar lo very large uh, corporations if you don't like them and what they're doing the problem is uh, the government and not them you have to get rid of government and and then these uh, business interests and these corporations would not have the ability to do many of the things that many people don't like you know, I'm wondering about the difference between just making a change, like if you could just have your wish and have governments disappear overnight versus some kind of a planned phase out. And the only reason I ask that question of which would be better is because if you made government disappear overnight, there are corporations, you mentioned Monsanto, which is now Bayer, I guess, and because um, Bayer bought them. But they have a lot of money and resources right now and they have a lot of malicious programs in progress trying to destroy a lot of things that are important for the world to survive. And if government was taken away but their resources were still there, held by Bayer, ex-Monsanto company, um, what prevents them from becoming a, a de facto new government by force? Well, <laughs> it gets uh, these things get a little bit kind of complicated or whatever, but these corporations can't really do the things that governments can do. So one of the questions you asked me, which is a really interesting question, is 
if I had the ability to just press a button and turn off government, would I do it? And actually, I wouldn't. And the reason is because if I did that, I'd be no better than any government. I'd be enforcing my will upon everyone de facto without anyone having any ability to say anything. I'd say, oh, some government's all gone. And in fact, so many people are so brainwashed today that if those governments were just gone all of a sudden, all the police just disappeared, all the courts disappeared, all the public schools just disappeared, uh, the White House, the Congress disappeared, which would be so great, but uh, if it all did, um, most people would be just so confused, and so many people are so um, get paid through the system that there would be a massive amount of chaos if it just disappeared overnight. I actually believe that we have to educate people and inform them and, and wake them up and voluntarily get them information so that they, they start to realize that they don't want these sort of things. Now, okay. you, you mentioned what's go, what would stop if there was no government, one of these corporations would become a government. You're, you're kind of right on that. And and that's what I always say is kind of the worst case scenario. Let's say yeah, we not, a, not an elected government, of course, right. it would just enforce its own will because right. it's got the resources. Yeah. Well, that's really no different than what we have today. It really right, is right, not that right. different. No, I'm just and, asking and, and, how to prevent that. That's Right. Uh, so that's an interesting thing it, that a lot of people say, well, if we get rid of government, then these large interests may eventually form a government again one day, maybe very quickly, maybe within a year they'd already form a new government. It's like, yeah, so the very worst case scenario from all of this is that we end up back to where we were. So we can't go worse than where we are today by trying to get rid of government. Uh, we can only go better. And yes, it actually could get back to if we don't educate people enough, they could get fooled again into allowing this to happen. But almost every entity, whether you want to call it a government or a big ruler class or a big criminal organization, they're all the same things. Uh, whatever it is, they have to have a certain amount of the people actually accept it. And they can have them accept it a few different ways. They can have it, have them accept it through pure fear. And that's what sort of East Germany was. That's what North Korea appears to be. Enough people who are so in fear that they, they, they're they not willing to stand up to the government. Um, or you have enough people who actually think it's a good thing. And so if you have a, a group come in, let's just say... Um, U.S. government disappears today and a group comes in and they've got trillions of dollars for whatever reason and they, they come in with lots of guys with guns and they make uh, tons of laws. They say American football is not allowed anymore, all pizzas to be banned, uh, all this sort of stuff. Mo most Americans have guns. The, this, this group <laughs> and most Americans like football. They really do. You can just see that. Uh, well, they really like pizza. And pizza too. would be the, like the last straw. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So very quickly, the people wouldn't stand for it, right? So the, the, whatever this entity is, has to have at least enough ability to use um, um, a violence against that they can't uh, at least come anywhere near. And so people are living in enough fear uh, or they have to at least ha do things that the people kind of think, well, maybe this is a good thing, right? So they, in, in most ways, they have to be able to do something that... Uh, what convinces enough people they can't just come in and do that you look at the u.s and this we've seen this already Al alcohol was outlawed in the u.s in the 1930s that more people drank alcohol during the 1930s than most other decades if i get the numbers right because people were like what forget it we're not doing that and so there's all this underground stuff that's actually how the kennedys became rich they were like uh, rum smugglers and stuff like that which is great totally support it uh you look at uh, marijuana it's been outlawed for decades because it kind of wakes people up a little bit and it's actually one of the best medicines out there it actually cures cancer and all this kind of stuff uh but most people have smoked marijuana most people have access to marijuana it's not a problem whatsoever so even if the government's put in these things, it doesn't necessarily mean that the people are going to do them. It just means that people will adjust their how they live to, to avoid the government finding out about it. Um, but, you know, I guess the real point of your question was, if the, if the U.S. government was gone, couldn't a worse government come in and take over? It's like, it's already pretty bad. I can't imagine one much worse coming in. You already have a lot of Americans talking about a revolution right now with the current U.S. government. Uh, they've only kind of uh, made that go away a little bit with uh, putting in Donald Trump and making them feel like they got their guy in, which totally is not the case. He's no different than Barack Obama or George Bush or any of them. He's the exact same thing, doing the exact same things. But... Uh, no, they can't really bring in too much worse. Uh, we're getting to the worst of all governments almost across the world today. Um, so, as I mentioned, the, the worst case scenario, if we got rid of government, is, yeah, we could end up uh, back with government again at some point. But that's always the worst case scenario. Right, right. Okay. So, what, what you're, I mean, 
besides this just being a nice idea, obviously people that believe in it want it to happen. So as far as how, which is the obvious question, you, I think what you're implying is you do it by education and raising awareness and consciousness, right? Absolutely. Uh, that's the only way that is legitimate for this idea to spread. Uh, <laughs> there used to be some uh, anarchists, and this is where some of those ideas came from, that anarchists are like blowing stuff up. There used to be some anarchists who said, if we're going to get rid of government, we got to go in and blow it all up. Um, that just does not work. And that is In not other words, government is the buildings, right? Yeah, true, right? That's sort of what that uh, V for Vendetta was all about. Uh, the Guy Fox sort of situation. A lot of people say he was an anarchist when he actually wasn't. He was trying to install his own government and he was trying to take out the government by destroying just its building. <laughs> uh, you know, the government isn't the building. The government is, people actually believe it's legitimate and you have to uh, try to get them to understand that the, the, what they believe is legitimate is not only not helping them, but is actually hurting them. And I think as we're, what we're seeing with the government's becoming more in debt, they're printing more money now just to stay alive a little longer. Um, all these wars, people are starting to realize that a lot of this stuff is not good whatsoever. Uh, it's getting worse and worse. And as it gets worse, people are just starting to wake up. Like even, for example, Permit Patty this week. I don't know if you saw this one. The, the lady who called the cops on the little girl who was selling water because she didn't have a permit. Uh, Th that caused an outroar across the, the world, really, like uh, definitely across the U.S. It's been like tens of millions of people uh, like saying what a horrible woman this was. This little girl was trying to sell a little bit of uh, bottled water outside of her apartment building because she wanted to go to Disneyland. Really cute, yeah. really entrepreneurial, really what you should want from every kid. Really, they shouldn't be in the schools. They should be out there hustling, learning how life works, trying to make something and, and try to learn how to work and stuff like that. And this little girl was and this, this uh, older lady uh, got on her phone and of course called the government because she didn't have her permit and she got totally um, uh, just hurt on the internet and to the point where she lost her job over it. The people, they're getting so much phone calls that I guess where she was working that they fired her. Uh, so so that's great. That, that's what we need is just more people just to, to realize. And so what, what that told me with Permit Patty was that a lot of people realize a lot of this government stuff is really just bad. It's not good at all. Like your average person really realizes it's not good to call the government if you don't like something someone's doing uh, and want the government to have to give them permission to be able to sell water on the street. Your average person still kind of understands that's not really good. Um, so there is people waking up to it. Uh, they just don't know there's any other answer because they've really been, uh, uh, from the moment they're born almost, put into indoctrination camps and television programming and propaganda where on TV every night is the cops save the day who, oh, we could never have solved yeah. this problem without the cops uh, or the president, you know, all the Hollywood movies, oh, the president just saved <laughs> saved America again, you know. Well, uh, even, the, even the private heroes that aren't part of the government are do you know, save everybody by shooting all the bad guys faster than anybody else. Yeah. It's even, a, even the women archetypes are the ones that can shoot the fastest now. Yeah, uh, so your average person just really doesn't realize there's any other way to live. And, uh, you know, we now have the Internet. Uh, that's been a huge improvement. Uh, we now have the ability to get this information out there. So shows like yours, no one would even know about your show without the Internet. Uh, it's right. just like uh, you we wouldn't be on CNN with this show or I don't know what the main radio stations are in the U.S. I don't listen to the radio, but they – they wouldn't have your show on it, so it's way too uh, against the system. It's way too waking people up. You're you're raising people's consciousness. That's never anything that the system wants. Uh, so we now have the ability to get the information out there. We also now have a, a money system that doesn't necessarily need to be controlled by the government, and that's things like cryptocurrencies, which is another big thing. So we've got all these opportunities now to get this information out there, to uh, wake people up, to give them other solutions, things like you don't have to use dollars anymore. You can use Bitcoin or, or use a gold-backed cryptocurrency or whatever you want to do. Uh, so we, we have the ability to wake people up. We have the channels. Of course, that's been a big part of why they're doing all this censorship now. All this, um, this the censorship is just unbelievable. It's at this getting point. really intense, yeah. Yeah, like pretty much if you're not saying exactly what the government mainstream narrative is on something, you're getting blocked on Twitter, YouTube, Facebook, you, you name it. Um, 
pretty much everyone is. If you're not CNN or Fox, uh, which, you know, it's funny because Donald Trump calls CNN fake news. It is, and but so is Fox, and so is everything else on the mainstream media. But if you're not saying the mainstream narratives, uh, you're pretty much getting blocked. So people need to be aware of that too. And, and there is a ways around that. There's more than just Facebook and YouTube out there. There's actually decentralized social media platforms now. Yeah. Uh, one in particular that I really like is steemit.com, S-T-E-E-M-I-T.com. And you actually get paid in cryptocurrency just to post on the site. And, and it really works. I've made hundreds of thousands of dollars posting on the site, believe it or not. And so many people have made uh, hundreds or thousands of dollars just posting on the site. And it's decentralized. It's on a blockchain, so it can't be censored. Uh, it has spun off actually something called DTube, which is a version of YouTube, which actually you get paid for posting videos onto it. Uh, and it can't be censored as well. So as much as the government and, and the state uh, do things to try to stop us, we also have our ways of getting around it and fighting back and 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 going over their censorship and, and getting past their ways of blocking information and things like that. It's, an, it's sort of like a never-ending ongoing battle at this point, but we've never really had more opportunity to wake people up uh, across the world than we have today. So that's really why I do as many of these interviews as possible and uh, just out there as much as possible because okay. they, they will try to block it more and more and we'll keep finding ways around it. But we really have the opportunity right now to wake people up. Right. And so you mentioned cryptocurrency, which has, has a big role, I think. But what about the um, relationship between the role of cryptocurrency and precious metal like silver? Well, uh, the, you know, there's so many differences between precious metals and cryptocurrencies, but a, a in some ways they're, they're very similar. The main key thing is if we want to have a world of prosperity and peace, uh, we need to make it so the government does not control the money system. And that's essentially what we have today. It's actually not even the government. It's a bunch of private bankers. And this goes back to the old thing, like the corporations kind of own the government. That's true. Uh, they right. do. The Federal Reserve is not part of the government, but it controls the money system. But it's kind of part of the government as well. It's just sort of all tied together in various ways. But when they do that, they can control everything. Uh, so if we can have a currency or money that isn't controlled by the government or central banks, it's much, much better. They can't, uh, all of a sudden, they can't do all their extortion, their taxation. Uh, they can't do their inflation, which impoverishes people. Uh, they can't have their wars because you can't really have these wars without central banks. This is what uh, Ron Paul said that, that it's no coincidence that the 20th century was a century of total war. It was also a century of central banking. You can't have these wars, these major wars without money printing, without inflation, without central banking, without extortion, taxation. Uh, we can get rid of all those things just by using a non government currency. Now, that can be gold and silver. Excellent. I'm a huge proponent of it. I actually say have more gold and silver than you have cryptocurrency because cryptocurrency is very new. It's very volatile. It's still very speculative. Uh, we still don't know exactly how it's going to play out. Whereas gold and silver have been around for thousands of years and been used by humanity as money for thousands of years. So it has that track record and it still does to this day. You can go almost anywhere in the world still today except for the U.S. and, and <laughs> offer them some gold or silver and they'll go, okay, I'll accept that in exchange for whatever I have my house, my computer, whatever you want to buy. Uh, in the U.S., Mark Dice did a bunch of YouTube videos. It's totally true. And he went out on the street and he, he had a Hershey bar, a chocolate bar, and a 10-ounce yeah. uh, silver bar. And he asked people which one they'd like. And he was going to give them whatever they oh, preferred. Okay. Everyone chose the chocolate bar. They, uh, that's unbelievable. Wow. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah, that's how the, the level of awareness in the U.S., right? Yeah. So, yeah, so, got yeah really what, some of the silver people say, for example, that the cryptocurrency theoretically could go to near zero any at any time, and it is theoretically possible. Um, and it, you can't take all the value away from precious metal. So they bring that up. But the other is more convenient. That's for sure. Yeah, convenience is a huge one. We live in a digital age, so the ability to transfer money anywhere in the world very quickly for almost no cost, yeah. uh, that cryptocurrency definitely has the advantage there. Uh, the precious metals have a number of advantages. One is they are actually used as a commodity, as you pointed out. Uh, so worst case scenario, even if for whatever reason people didn't want to use it as money anymore, it still has a number of uses. Um, I think they're both excellent. In fact, I really like 
uh, uh, precious metals backed cryptocurrencies. That sort of solves the problem of, of both uh, of their issues uh, in, in terms of ease of transfer and uh, cheapness. Uh, cryptocurrencies are, are a lot better, uh, but then you can actually back cryptocurrencies with precious metals. Now, this comes down to who actually owns the precious metals, though, and if you don't hold yeah. it, you don't own it. And it really comes down to who do you trust. So uh, there's a number of uh, uh, groups out there who have uh, vaults that are all insured and, and, and all these sort of things. And it's, it basically comes down to if you if you believe you own gold in there, do you believe you actually own it or not? If you do, and, you know, there's, you know, to an extent you can kind of trust uh, certain people to a certain point. Um, and especially if it's insured and all that sort of stuff, it, it adds to your, your trust level. Um, then these sort of things can really work. Now, uh, the one thing about cryptocurrencies that's great is you don't have to trust anyone at all. Uh, when you own your cryptocurrency, you own the private key. No one else in the world, including the government, can access it unless they can somehow uh, get you to give up your private key. Um, but unless they can, uh, you have complete control of your money. So they both have value. And that, at the Dollar Vigilante, we recommend them both. In fact, we recommend owning a lot more precious metals than crypto. Uh, we're at, I think we say 10% of your portfolio on crypto right now, uh, but that 10%, we've been recommending crypto since 2011 when Bitcoin was $3. Uh, we recommended Ethereum at $2. It's now $400. Um, so we've done incredibly well with the crypto, but it's not just about making money. It's about actually getting these things out there and getting them used by the public so that we can get off of these central bank uh, money systems, which bring up so much poverty. Uh, uh, they bring about so much war. Uh, they they impoverish so many people and, and they really steal from from so many people. Uh, if we can get rid of those systems, it'd, it'd be beautiful. So it's, I'm not even in the cryptocurrencies because you can make a fortune, but you can make a fortune. But but I'm in it because same reason as gold. I gold yes, it, gold and silver will probably rise in value dramatically over the next few years. Uh, but even if it doesn't, I still want to have gold and silver. I, I want to have whatever is outside of the the government uh, money system, and I'd, I'd prefer to see the government money system just go to go away altogether so what's the current status more or less of of the government attacks on cryptocurrency and wanting to control it and tax it and things like that which i'm sure they would want to do yeah okay. uh, talk about having a 20-hour radio show just to even scratch the surface on yeah. all the different levels uh, because of course you're talking about every government they've all got different rules and laws and regulations yeah. uh, but to, to make a short answer to that uh, how can they control it they can't that's the beautiful thing that's why cryptocurrencies are so amazing is there is no bitcoin office there is no bitcoin ceo uh, there is no bitcoin corporation uh, bitcoin doesn't exist anywhere so the one thing the government is really good at is extorting people and killing people and using violence and you can't do that against math and that's basically all cryptocurrencies are is math that are in the cloud essentially that you can't even find even if you want to find it it's it's absolutely beautiful so uh, they can't control it so what they're trying to do of course is find ways to slow it down to um, uh, you know, even make it illegal. Some countries have made it illegal, but as I pointed out earlier, they made alcohol illegal in the 30s. They made marijuana illegal most of the 20th century. Still had access to it. And hopefully, people do the same thing with cryptocurrencies and realize who cares if these criminals make it illegal. Uh, you know, it's it's more important that we use these free market uh, monies so that we can get rid of those criminal organizations. Right. Right. Exactly. So. Um Right now, it seems like because of the security of the blockchain, it's not likely to be completely penetrated by the authority figures, even though they would like to, right? Well, just so you know, every cryptocurrency has its own blockchain. So we're talking about, again, thousands and thousands of different ones. Some of them are better, some of them are worse. But if, if we just talk about Bitcoin, yeah, there is no way for any one person to take control of it. Um, so in that sense, it's, it's very, very secure from any sort of government interference. So really, the interference comes in in how governments deal with human beings who still have a lot of fear and really a lot of self-interest. So when you put a gun to their head and say, if we catch you with Bitcoin, you're going to go into a rape camp for 20 years, which they call prison, uh, they, uh, you know, a lot of people might just decide not to own Bitcoin because they might be too scared or, or whatever the reason might be. But uh, as far as actually... Uh, 
someone taking control and and busting in with a SWAT team and and taking control of Bitcoin, it's not possible. Uh, there is no one point of failure. There is no one place. Uh, it's it's everywhere. That's that's what really is the value of of cryptocurrencies that a lot of people still don't fully realize is the value is that government can't control it. Do you feel like mentioning any metal backed cryptocurrencies because most people never heard of any? Yeah, I, I don't mention too many publicly because I'm I still want to make sure they do really uh, fully secure and, and that sort of thing. I don't want to be mentioning some and they turn out they weren't very legitimate and, right. and then people go, oh, I heard about it from me. I, you know, I don't want that problem. Um, you know, it reminds me of the original situation with the goldsmiths who became bankers. I don't know when this first happened, but they were storing gold and then they figured out they could issue receipts and say, well, don't worry, we have the gold. And then they said, well, nobody's going to check. We can issue 10 times the number of receipts. And it, yep. it turned into fractional reserve banking. And and you're kind of going back to that first chapter to see whether they do it again or whether they stay honest. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, with technology today, like I've seen a number of people talking about gold-backed cryptocurrencies they want to launch and this kind of technology they're using. So they're like literally laser engraving each ounce and you can actually somehow tell if that ounce is in the vault uh, using some sort of infrared technique like it's got you know the technology is and you could tell them you want your ounce right 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 now of course just because the gold's there doesn't mean they haven't sold it to someone else yeah Uh, yeah. but if it is a crypto uh and and you know the you could what you could say is well i know i own that crypto and that one crypto is in the crypto itself it says i own this one ounce which is laser infrared engraved or whatever yeah. and then if you can even see it using the technology you can they actually are talking about doing these sort of things in the vault you can actually see your ounce like where it is and it hasn't moved and all that okay. kind of stuff then like you can google have earth more, for gold basically yeah yeah basically it's yeah. amazing what you can do with the technology so you can have a lot more um uh, confidence that that you haven't been ripped off uh, nowadays than you ever could. Not to say that people won't get ripped off. I'm sure, absolutely sure. I have no doubt. Some people are going to end up losing some gold or silver because someone's going to find a way to rip them off using cryptocurrencies one way or another. But you know, just with like with anything, just be careful um, and uh, you know, don't put all your eggs in one basket uh, and try to do your research on which ones you think are the most legitimate and reasonable and have the best people behind them and have the most insurance and the best security systems and all that kind of stuff and then you know make your own decision based on that and this is something that dollar vigilante talks about too right yeah absolutely that's a big part of what we talked about we even wrote a a thing called getting your gold out of dodge this is even we wrote that before cryptocurrencies even existed or actually before i knew they existed i found out about bitcoin in 2011 so we've been talking about all these sort of things uh for a number of years and actually just done really well because um Things like precious metals, gold was two hundred dollars at the start of this uh, millennia. Uh, it's now at uh, you know well over twelve hundred dollars. So it's gone up six times uh, in the last uh, eighteen years. So that's pretty good. Uh, a lot of people don't realize that. Uh, so a lot of the things that we've been recommending people get into, uh, especially the cryptocurrencies, have really done very well even before this final end game sort of collapse that we're expecting in the next few years even happens. We're still profiting along the way from it. So in an inverse kind of way, the the price of gold having gone up is a measure of inflation of the fiat currency, right? Yeah, absolutely. Like all prices in the economy are a measure to one extent or another of inflation. Of course, there's other things involved as well, uh, supply and demand. Mm -hmm. Uh, But but in one way or another, yeah, every price of everything is a measure in one way or another of the monetary inflation of the currency. Does inflation come from anywhere besides just printing a whole bunch of make-believe money? Uh, Not if you understand the way inflation actually really works, because really what inflation means, this is one thing, they always try to confuse people about the definition of terms. So they've, for decades now, whenever prices rise, they'll go on their news programming from their news readers, which is literally brainwashing, and they'll go, Oh, prices of uh, wheat is rising. That's inflation. And there's inflation in the price of wheat. And it just uh, happens. It, there's yeah. no reason. It just happens. Right. That's what they do. They want to confuse people. Yeah. Uh, so they've gotten people to believe the symptom of inflation, which is the rising of prices, 
is what inflation is, but it's not. Inflation is the increase in the money supply. And you can actually look and fi find out using various ways the actual increase in the amount of money supply that's actually going on in every country, especially the U.S. You can look at Federal Reserve and there's ways to do it. We actually report on it every month at the Dollar Vigilante in our newsletter, the actual increase in the money supply. Lately, it's been between 5 and 10% per year of actual increase in the money supply. What happens is that money goes out. There's all this new money. It filters through. It usually goes to the government people first and the corporations and all that kind of stuff. They get all the money first. It's called the trickle-down effect, as they call it. Eventually, they start doing stuff with that money, whether it be investing or buying cars or buying houses or whatever. And eventually, other people start to get that money. By the time the money gets through to the whole economy, that money has been devalued by the amount of money that's been increased. So, for example, if they printed 10% more money this year, which is actually pretty much what they're doing, eventually everything in the economy will go up in price 10%. It just won't happen all at once because it has to take time to filter through the economy for all the things to balance out and for people to realize what's going on and, and things like that. That's the real sneak trick of inflation. And I think it was John Maynard Keynes who said, not one man in a million uh, understands inflation. And it's still pretty close to the truth. I'd say it's probably closer to maybe one in 10,000 or one in a thousand now uh, understand inflation, but it's still the biggest sort of scam ever done on humanity. It's essentially a way to rob everyone. And for a very, very small percent of the population, it's not even the 1%, it's literally the 0.000001% uh, are actually robbing everyone else through this process of inflation. And most people still don't have any idea it's going on or even understand how it works well so one way to look at it would be that the the fiat currency that's out there and by fiat it's just decreed this money has this value the fiat currency that's out there doesn't have any value the value is in the things that you would buy with it and those things are still sitting where they were before the increase in the amount of money supply so just by kind of an auction system which is going on all the time you'd have to bid 10 percent higher if there's 10% more money in everybody's hands for the same yeah. goods, right? Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's all supply and demand. So money is always one half of every transaction, <laughs> unless you're bartering. Unless I sell you my sailboat for, for you know, uh, a case of wine or something like that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. In, in most transactions, money is half of every transaction. And when you increase that money supply, that devalues the, the value of that money. That's just basic supply and demand. The problem is... When someone has just increased the money supply, no one else in the economy knows that money supply has really increased yet. They haven't seen right. the effects of that yet. So the very first person who gets it thinks, oh, well, this dollar is worth the same as the dollar that I got had yesterday. It's actually not, but they don't realize yet. It's not until it filters through the economy that everyone starts to realize, wait a sec, there's way more, way more money here than we thought there was. Therefore, the price of everything has to increase in supposed value. It's actually not increasing in value. It's increasing just in the amount of money that you need to price. buy. Yeah. Right. Yeah, right. And if the banks are the first people to get the new amount of money. Which they, they always can, are. The delay <laughs> factor means they can buy as if there's no inflation. Absolutely. That's part, a big part of the scam. Yeah. Um, the other thing is, since we talked about solutions for this whole situation are in the realm of consciousness of the, of the people, you know, to be able to function without tyranny um, and to realize that that's normal. Increasing the consciousness of the people has to do with their person, what they do personally every day in their actions and their thoughts and their lifestyle and everything. And it reminded me of what I noticed in watching one of your recent discussions on Anarchast was that you made some big changes in your own personal lifestyle that I think are connected to consciousness. And I wondered if there's a way to share some of what helped you do that and what you were getting out of it. Oh, uh. Man, talk about another whole long story, but... <laughs> yeah, um, restrict your answer to 10 hours if you can. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the short story is that um, after kind of myself believing a lot of what I was told my whole life by the mainstream media and television, movies and all that kind of stuff, a society, uh, the cult, the culture, whatever it was saying, um, after believing a lot of what they said and actually doing a lot of it, so I believed that if I made a lot of money, that if I had a lot of girls, girlfriends, uh, if I could just, you know, travel around as I wanted and made a lot of money, that I'd be really happy. And um, I became, 
you know, a millionaire by the time I was 30 years old. Um, and very quickly afterwards, just started to realize that none of these things that I thought that I was told by the culture that, you know, the, that I, I believe were true about what would actually make me happy, they weren't actually true at all. In fact, I was less happy uh, ha having the things that I thought were supposed to make me happy. So this led me down a path of actually getting quite depressed, um, uh, drinking a lot, uh, and just really going sort of backwards, just uh, in terms of consciousness, just wanting to become unconscious, just almost wanting to kill myself, really, because I was like, oh, man, like, all, I worked my whole life to, to try to reach this point, And now I'm here. And it's, I'm like, not happy whatsoever. What do you do then, right? Like, the, especially when you don't know there's any other options. It's like, it feels really depressing. Like, oh, my gosh, like, I, I guess I'll never be happy. <laughs> and it's like, well, I guess there's nothing I can do. And, and all that sort of stuff. And it really reached a point where I was I was quite suicidal. This is about three, four years ago, and um, I decided because I had a, a, a family with kids that uh, you know killing myself probably wasn't the best idea. So I thought I I better search and see if I can find some other answer that just isn't generally out there. And one of the first things that sort of propped up on my radar was things like psychedelics and things like ayahuasca and iboga, and being a kind of an extreme person myself. You know, just the idea, oh, just go see a therapist and talk it out and, you know, take a couple of years and you can talk it out. And to me, that just like, I, I'm more of the kind of person like, why don't I take the most extreme psychedelic plant <laughs> in the world, Evoga, and and see if that works. And, and so that's generally what I did. I started off with ayahuasca and then I did a boga and that was like the hardest thing I've ever done in my life um, I would never do it again in those ways that I did it so there's ways to do it that are better but I was it's basically torture for two full days but by oh, you mean, you, was, mean like, you mean hard uncomfortable when you were doing it oh yeah it was like the hardest thing I've ever done uh, I don't even know how to explain it really all I know is that when it was over I I thank God it was over <laughs> and uh you mean like in kind of physical torture is one element. Yeah, it felt like I was almost like frozen for like two entire days. I couldn't move and my brain was like just going crazy with all this stuff going on. And I don't know, like it just felt like I was like in a haunted house of horrors for like two straight days. And uh, and even like even when the, the stuff kind of turned off, all the hallucinations and all this stuff. And then I was just in complete darkness for what seemed, it seemed like years. And it seemed like I couldn't move, and it seemed like I was in darkness for years. And really what that did, and I think this is part of what psychedelics can do at, at certain levels, is it just made me had to look at myself. So I was sitting there in the dark for what seemed like years, and I couldn't move. And you start to think about your life, and you're forced to look at your life. And really what it did was it made me go through about 10 years of psychotherapy in about two days, uh, all on my own with myself. And it was super, super hard. I wouldn't go back and change it now because it actually put me down the path where I am on now, but it was not easy to do whatsoever. But what it did was it shocked me out of my depression, out of my stupor, out of my sense of hopelessness. I all of a sudden had a sense of hope. I was like, okay, well, that was really hard, but I'm so much better now. Then I went into looking into what else I could improve. I started going to more of the physical health stuff and I just started getting physically better because I'd become kind of a wreck. I was just basically just drinking alcohol and not eating anything good whatsoever for years, smoking cigarettes. Yeah. Um, I was just like a toxic waste dump basically for a couple of years. And I started getting better, started going for walks, starting getting into health supplements, started doing things like ozone therapy and hyperbaric chambers and stem cells. And these are all things I've just done recently too. Like I, I do these things all the time now. And then I got to the point where I was pretty good physically and I started to feel I, he I heard about meditation about how you should connect you know get a you know look inward all this sort of stuff and I started doing that and all of a sudden it, that started to really work for me um, just the meditation both looking inward and also a feeling of connection with whatever you know is out there the universe so many different words for it the universe god the creator nature mother earth whatever you want to call them energy right. uh, all those sort of things and that was really amazing and so i just continued with that and um actually i got i went quite a ways down that path and it was quite good but i still had i still didn't feel quite happy uh 
And then actually, I was working with a hypnotherapist, and uh, after a while, he said, let's go for one week into the Rocky Mountains in Canada, where I was originally from, and let's go into like one week of like hypnosis therapy, and we did, and at the end of that, I actually felt really amazing. So, this entire process from the start of the psychedelics to now, which I just finished this hypnotherapy just uh, two weeks ago, uh, was about three years long, and it was like sort of like two steps forward, one step back the entire way. But always that two steps forward and to the point now where I'm actually feeling pretty amazing. Uh, I feel, I don't even know how to describe it. Like I just have so much energy. I feel actually quite happy. I feel joyful. I feel um, a lot of the things that I didn't think were even possible. But they were all by doing things that n you never hear about in the schools, in television programming, <laughs> uh, from our cult, our culture in general. In our cult, oh, you're feeling bad? Well, go have a beer, right? That's, that's what they, they would basically say. Or go to your doctor and he'll give you some chemicals. Yeah, uh, which exactly. Which will mostly make you uh, want to kill yourself or shoot up right. schools, basically. But there's other chemicals that will fix you up after that. <laughs> oh, yeah. They, they always yeah. got a plan. They'll keep right. you on the chemicals forever. No problem. Yeah. Yeah, incredible. That's what I sensed when I heard this last discussion that you were in that I was talking about is that there was some massive change on the consciousness level and that it involved your physical health. And I think, you know, the reason I was really focused on that now is because we have a goal, right? We want the world to be really harmonious and peaceful and for everybody to be okay as much as possible. I mean, it's really simple. That, that's pretty much it at least for the time that we're here on the physical level. But to get there is the, is the detail that is often, you know, a little bit fuzzy. And I think what you're illustrating is that if you want to change the outside and you have this vision of how the world could be so beautiful, you can't do it without starting with yourself. No matter what theory you have or what brilliant you know, person that you're following or something, if you're doing stuff that's not true to yourself, it doesn't matter what your theories are. You have to fix that first. And I I just think it's super inspiring that you did that. And I'm sure you're going to just keep doing it level to level to level as you go on. And who knows what's going to come out of it. Yeah, uh, <laughs> that's really the case. I really have no idea. Uh, I know that I'm so happy I've at least reached where I am right now and so much better than where I was. So much clearer, so much happier. Um, yeah. Not to say that I, I, I'm not like everyone else. I have bad days or anything, but uh, it's so. It was really just sort of a really coming to terms with who I really am. I think I avoided that question my whole life, uh -huh. um, and really avoided dealing with the traumas that I had had, as in, everyone has through childhood and all that sort of stuff. I just, I had, for whatever reason, put it all into my subconscious and and just totally wiped it from my conscious and so yeah i really don't even know where i'm at right now and i don't know if there's an end point or anything but i i do know that i'm happy i'm here and i'm totally happy to continue to to yeah. advance even more if i can i don't even know how at this point but i continue to do all the kinds of things that we just mentioned the meditation the yoga the i still see my um my hypnotherapists are still working on stuff and and trying to improve certain things and and yeah really just working on yourself that one thing that you know we started this uh talk talking about what is anarchy and why why how can we get the word world to anarchy and really back in the old days it was a very outward facing sort of thing it was like yeah government is bad and we need to change that and uh, so many other anarchists like me were like that and in the last few years I don't know what it is and people talk about this conscious consciousness shift going on or whatever it is almost all of us are like this now where we've started to realize that if we're going to change the world the the first place to start is with ourselves yeah and it's not just some kind of philosophy it, it's actually practical like mm -hmm. if because of what you've done and, you know, you're inspiring all these other people to try to do the same thing for them, whatever works in their case, um, it puts a whole different energy and power into whatever it is you do on the outside. So, you could be giving a talk about anarchy or about whatever you want to talk about. If you're in a mess internally, it's going to leave people with the residue of that mess even if they don't understand it. Mm -hmm. But if you're clearer inside they're also not going to understand, why do I feel really good, you know, and inspired and excited to try to do some better things in my own life? I, it just comes through, and it, it, 
I, I'm probably not explaining it very well, but it's what you've done inside yourself. Uh, no matter what cause you're working for on the outside, it totally transforms it. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I don't know how to explain it either, and I've just sort of learned about these things the last few months, but I definitely can feel that they're true. And the more that I think about it, the, the people in my life who I've really affected me, they really had figured out a lot of their inward stuff, and they, they were living their, their truth. They were living their passion, and you could see that. And then you see other people, and they've got all the stats. They're like, look, the government's bad. I've got all the stats. But you look at the guy, and you just get this sense like he hasn't even figured himself out. He's like sleeping on his friend's couch, and you know, like he just hasn't figured himself out at all, but he's trying to fix the world. And it's like, well, you know, why should I? He's not really that inspiring, or why should I even listen to him because he hasn't really even fixed himself? How's he going to help fix the world? I don't know how, how it all works, but there's something definitely to it <laughs> that yeah. uh, you, you, yes. you, fixing yourself, all of a sudden it makes everything that you're trying to change in the world around you. And this is sort of getting to the create your own reality sort of thing, which I kind of believe in now because I've seen it happen with to myself yeah. so many times. You create your own reality uh, by changing yourself inside and all of a sudden everything around you starts to change. I don't understand how it works, but I, I know that I've seen it happen so many times now. It changes the behavior even of other people, even yeah, if like you don't instantly. try to, even if you didn't explain anything to them, just by <laughs> being around you in your new self, it's uh, it's really interesting phenomenon. So yeah, even like in the last uh, since I finished with my um, hypnotherapist, I've only met with about three people uh, that I knew. Uh, you know, that uh, other than my family, I've only met with about three people, and within about fifteen seconds of them walking up. They're like, wow, you've changed. I'm like, I haven't yeah. even said anything yet. They just sensed it. No, and as soon as I saw how you looked in your last discussion, I knew it was a complete change. Yeah, it's yeah, amazing because, like, I look in the mirror and I'm like, well, I'm still me. I don't know right, who exactly, right. but like, it's I guess on a humans, we still can sense. We're almost, you know, there's a lot we sense that we don't see just with our eyes. I guess. I, right? I think we have forgotten uh, capabilities that are dormant, mm. and those can start coming back. And um, what you described is kind of the difference in approaches between drugging yourself so that you don't have to feel uncomfortable pushing it into the subconscious, as you said, versus saying, look, whatever it is, I understand now. I just want to go toward it and see all of it because the end is going to be good because look how the world is created. I mean, everything's so beautiful that we're the same as that. And so um, unconsciousness just postpones our enjoyment of harmonizing it. Um, I guess, you know, where I'd end up with it, and I don't want to keep you longer than what you requested to do. I think you wanted to go 90 minutes at a, as a maximum, and we're almost there. So, um, I guess, one. Of, I mean, there's so many valuable things in what you're sharing, but one of them is for people that are reaching the point where there's, you know, there's just no point. They, they've gotten to... Um, a stage where awareness, which everybody is pushing in different ways, is being able to list all the bad things that are happening, right? And so you get really aware and you can say 20 different problems that will end life on the planet. And so I must be really aware now. And But that doesn't leave you feeling very good at all, if that's the end of it. And there's another kind of awareness that you're saying that is where all the, not just hope, because that could be based on nothing, but some real connection to inspiration it's coming from a different place than just reciting the problems so is, is there anything that you could say about it to encourage people that are feeling kind of low energy and discouraged at the moment oh um well one thing i can definitely say is i never thought i could be where i am today i thought this was impossible um even three years ago when people told me, I have a number of pretty good friends, and they're, they're kind of, you know, pretty conscious and, and aware, and all of them said, and I just looked at them, they all said, no, you're going to get there. Um, and I just looked at them like, you're crazy, because I don't even see how it's possible. I can't imagine myself being how I am today, three years ago. Part of it is that... Uh, you, you're not able because you're conscious. It gets really, man, it's so hard to explain this stuff. And I'm just learning how it all works just now. But your conscious is just not aware of a lot of stuff. Your subconscious seems to know everything. I don't know how it all works. But your conscious, when it's not aware of something, then it can't imagine something else happening because it's not even aware it's possible. But your subconscious totally knows it's possible. And it is possible. 
So my point is, if you're if you're like how I was a few years ago, and you just happen to cross this, and you're like, man, I'm just not happy. I'm never going to be happy. I don't even know how it's possible I could ever be happy. Just know that it's possible. And um, really, the main thing, and this is just it's so basic, it's so cliche, and Nike even used it as a slogan, is just do it. I really, just start doing something. And and you know, I started off with psychedelics, but I also started off with a lot of health stuff. I I did. So many things. I think I've done pretty much everything. <laughs> There's not any things I've done that you can name that I haven't done. Like I, I went out and I'm like, I'm gonna try everything and just figure out what works. And um, but really, if I never even just took the first step, I never even started, then I'd never get anywhere. You just have to get started. I think by having the intention uh, of wanting to get to, to somewhere else, even if you don't know how that's possible or even think it's possible, just by having that intention, you will and can get there. But just work on it just actually have that intention make that your intention every day you know it doesn't have to necessarily even be every day i'm sure there was many days this wasn't my intention but somewhere in my head it was in my head i'm going to work towards this and, and see what happens uh so really don't don't lose hope and you know another thing is there what i've come to realize is you don't really need a lot to be happy actually uh all these material items mean nothing um really almost nothing <laughs> like you can actually just be happy just being you the problem is as far as i can tell is we've been so programmed and propagandized and brainwashed and lied to and a lot of information hidden uh from us that most of us don't even know that's possible anymore so uh you know the other thing i, I could relay is by using outside things to make you happy whether that be alcohol or certain drugs or sex or food or you know, pretty much anything that you're kind of using to divert your attention away from your unhappiness. Uh, none of those things will ever work to make you happy. Uh, in fact, they're keeping you distracted from actually doing the work to become more happy. Uh, so, so, you know, if you think, oh, well, I just find uh, smoking marijuana every day makes me happier. Marijuana is not terrible and actually can be used in many ways, in so many good ways. And it is a good thing in many ways. But if you're using anything as a dependency for happiness, that generally means you're not happy. And really, you should be searching for the reason why. And the reasons why for me weren't actually all that difficult. It was really just getting to the point where I could understand them and, and doing the, the work on myself to be able to get to that understanding. It's kind of, I'm still trying to figure out what happened, to be honest. Uh, and my, my hypnotherapist even told me this. He's like, you probably won't be able to explain what happened to you for at least a few months. And and he's right. I'm, I'm still kind of like not sure what happened. And it wasn't just him, but that was sort of the end of a full multi-year process of working on myself. But the end, the end point is, if you're not happy and you want to change it, you can change it uh, and you can do it. Just make that your intention and, and have hope, have faith, as, as they say a lot in religions, have faith. I, I really understand what that means now. Have faith that anything is possible because it actually really is. You just don't know it yet. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And the end of one phase is the beginning of the next one. Yeah, I've gone through so many of those where I'm like, okay, I reached the end point. It's like, oh, wait, <laughs> I actually know less than I even knew before. <laughs> now, <I'm> like, <laughs> no, in, instead of being the oldest kid in elementary school, now you're the beginner in junior high. Mm, it keeps exactly. going like that. Yep. So, um, and I want to mention something that, that we started doing to support exactly what you're talking about. But before we do, I don't want to forget, if people want to be able to watch your anarchist, Anarchast shows, which are great, Please tell them how to do that. Sure. The easiest way is just on YouTube. Uh, it's Anarchast, A-N-A-R-C-H-A-S-T. Uh, and um, just go there on YouTube. You'll find us. We've got over 400 episodes now. Uh, and then if you want the Dollar Vigilante, it's also on YouTube. It's probably the easiest way. Just look up the Dollar Vigilante. Um, those are the two best ways. And then we have a conference every year, which is based on actually all the stuff that we've talked about in this, including the consciousness stuff. It's really become a lot more about that sort of stuff called a Narcopoco. Uh, you can find that at narcopoco.com. And that one's not easy to spell. It's A-N-A-R-C-H-A-P-U-L-C-O.com. Uh, yeah. If you come even close on Google, you'll probably find it. There's nothing else uh, quite uh, named quite as close as that. So uh, that's our annual event uh, right here in Acapulco, Mexico every February. Okay. And what date is that? Uh, in the coming February, it's February 14th to 17th. Okay, and so does that event have its own website or anything like that where people yep, can? It's just at narcopoco.com. 
Okay, excellent. And I just want to mention to you that since I'm in total agreement with you that if we want to make outside changes that are actually making things better, it depends on what we do internally. And we started a support group type division of the radio program that's a little bit safer to talk about freely and may survive the censorship a bit longer. And if anybody's interested in that, which is about consciousness and health, and individuals being helped in that direction and supported, that's at lostartsradio.com slash club. And it's kind of an exciting project. So I really want to invite people to that. Um, it, I think there's a lot of people that would benefit, and things are challenging enough in the outside world that we need to be at our best if we can. So, yeah, if you can let people know about that too, that would be great. And um, I hope we can kind of stay in touch. I want to, there's some things I want to send you. I'll send you by email so we don't keep you. And um, I just feel very appreciative of all the work that you're doing. So. Well, I thanks. appreciate it. Thank you very much, Richard. Uh, it's been a pleasure being on your show as well. Yeah, thanks. So have a good rest of the day, and we'll talk to you soon. Okay, thank you. All right, see you. Bye. Okay, thanks, everybody. Uh, Richard, do you want to do a last wrap-up, or are we good? Um, I guess that I would just say, you know, thank you to Jeff. I thought that was really interesting, and yeah. I, I especially appreciate it when people are willing to share what's happening with them personally, and it's not kind of a, a canned presentation, you know, but they're just out there, and this is who I am, and this is what I'm doing, and it's what used to be called becoming vulnerable, right, by being really honest and um, yeah. I just think it helps everybody because we're all in the same situation trying to learn the same lessons, figuring out the same stuff. And um, uh, one of the reasons we put together the club environment is, is that everybody thinks they're totally on their own and they're fighting their situations that nobody in the world would understand or anything like that. And that that's made worse by their health situations that they're getting drugs or what Jeff called toxic chemicals that you're supposed to swallow and become healthy. And then when that hurts you too much, they um, start cutting your organs out and stuff like that. Um, there really are much better ways to, to approach those things that have been taught for thousands of years. And um, I know I got really interested and spent decades adapting them for use under current conditions. And you can share that with us if you want to uh, show up at the club meetings and you can quit anytime you want. There's no big obligation to it, but it could lead to the creation of a physical school where we demonstrate these things and health and consciousness are directly connected to each other. And so, and that we're not taught that in school. We're taught that you have to poison everything to death so you can be healthy, and that's not exactly an accurate picture. You know, Pastor's germ theory was misunderstood, which he corrected later in his life. But by then, nobody was paying attention, and the drug industry got a big push by it. Um, there are much, much better things to do. It's all been discovered. It's all been worked with for thousands of years. If you get your health back, and you don't have to worry about aging and degeneration and infectious disease and uh, stuff like that anymore, then you can actually do the inner work that Jeff and others have been referring to much easier. And we wanted to form a kind of a support group teaching forum where we can share um, real cutting edge information about that stuff that is a little bit sensitive to share in a totally public forum like this especially with the increasing censorship but in a private club forum we can do it so check that out if you can lostartsradio.com slash club and also our Sunday show which has great guests on it and Jeff will be there as a replay of this show but all kinds of other great people that it's all free archives are there lostartsradio.com has all of it on the website or blogtalkradio.com slash lostartsradio and uh, there's the Facebook group that you may be listening through now and um, you know we're, we have different platforms we'll be starting real video shortly which is a new YouTube replacement being started by Mike Adams a friend of ours who we just talked to recently and uh, watch for us there in case we disappear off YouTube or Twitter or any of these other uh, interesting public platforms will be on real video. And if you go to lostartsradio.com, you'll be able to see other places that we start up too. And uh, stay in touch. You can 
reach us through the Facebook group or there's a forum that's free and accessible to anybody on uh, lostartsradio.com or you can email in uh, comments or questions or subjects you'd like covered about um, consciousness or health because I've been a researcher in those things since the mid-60s and I just want to share all this stuff with you guys now if it can be helpful. So I think that's about it and uh, thank you again to Jeff. I'm really happy to finally get him on the program. Yeah. Um, thank you all for giving us some time and I really appreciate it. Yep, we thank Jeff Berwick and uh, we appreciate everybody out there listening. Thanks for yeah. tuning in and we'll see you next time. Yeah, watch for us again. We'll see you soon. 